final series of the State Services and HCBS Service webinar. Um, we're going to be covering all the different services that are out there, and we're going to get started right now. Okay. So today, our presenters will be myself. I'm Meg Beyer. I work for ICL and MCTAC, and my wonderful colleague, Alam Elbadu, who works for CASA Columbia and MCTAC, will also be presenting with me. So what is MCTAC? MCTAC is the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center. Uh, we are a training, consultation, and educational resource center that offers resources to all mental health and substance use disorder providers in New York State. So we offer resources to all behavioral health providers in the state of New York. Our goal, our primary goal, is providing training and intensive support on quality improvement strategies, including business, organizational, and clinical practices to achieve the overall goal of preparing and assisting providers with the transition to Medicaid managed care. So who is MCTAC? Uh, MCTAC is made up of a collaborative partnership consisting of both the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research, which is housed out of the NYU Silver School of Social Work, and CASA Columbia. MCTAC also consists of a dynamic group of partners um, and a broad range of partners, including both provider and advocacy organizations. We span across New York State and bring to the table many rich perspectives and various areas of expertise that we deliver in our different technical assistance initiatives. Okay, and before we get started today, I just want to remind everyone about a few different pieces for our webinar. Um, we are going to refer to a lot of different resources and tools on today's webinar, um, including the fact that we are actually recording this webinar. So we will be posting the recording and the slides once this webinar is finished on MCTAC's website. And the website address is mctac.org. Just want to encourage everyone to visit the website, familiarize yourself with any tools and resources that we might mention, and also to sign up for our MCTAC newsletter. Um, almost on a weekly basis, we're sending out different announcements regarding upcoming training opportunities, events, um, any updates to state policy. So we would encourage everyone to uh, join the MCTAC listserv uh, so that we can connect everyone with the latest and up, most up-to-date information. Also, <clears throat> I want to encourage everyone, there is a chat box um, on the WebEx, and I would encourage you, if you have any questions, to type in your questions in the chat box um, and submit them that way. Alam and I have a lot of content to get through today. So um, just as we've done in every other webinar, uh, we encourage everyone to submit any questions they have. We will do our best to answer them. However, um, if we are unable to, we do uh, have a way of pulling all the questions that come in, and we'll review them afterwards and create a frequently asked question tool that we'll likely post on mctac.org. So again, even if we don't get to your question this morning, um, we really would appreciate if you send it in. We'll do our best to get it answered, and we will look to put together a frequently asked question tool um, <laughs> to answer all of these questions. So and the last thing I want to emphasize before I get started um, looking at the mental health services is that today we're going to focus on just a few services. Not This is not comprehensive. This is not all services, um, we are going to be doing future training for deficit and contract funded programs that are not covered in the content of today's webinar. So I just want to emphasize that. We know that today's, the content of today's webinar is not all encompassing and that we will be doing future training um, in the coming months. So thank you. And with that, I'm going to start off talking through some of the different mental health services that are available. Okay. So the first one I'm going to just walk through, I know there's a lot of text on here. Please don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> um, again, we put these webinars together really as a tool, um, not only you know live as a tool to walk through with us, but also once they're recorded and the slides are posted online, as a tool that people can review as needed um, if they want to refresh their knowledge about different services that are available. So I'm just going to walk through some of the elements and components of these different services. Alam will do the same for the substance use disorder side, and then we will both share um, in reviewing the HCBS services. Okay, so this first service is the clinic 
service, Article 31 clinics. And these are really, um, you know, areas and places that can provide treatment designed to minimize the symptoms and adverse effects of illness, also increasingly important to maximize wellness and promote recovery. So all of the following services um, a clinic treatment program for adults can provide. Um, before I go through these, I just want to emphasize that today's training is geared towards adult behavioral health uh, providers. Um, we are strictly talking about the adult population, so what we are referring to today really is just geared towards adult providers. Okay, so again, these are just some of the different services that can be provided at an Article 31 OMH clinic. Outreach, assessment, um, initial assessment and psychiatric assessment, crisis intervention, injectable psychotropic medication, um, just again, I'm not going to go through everything because these will be posted online, but really there's various different treatment modalities that can be provided um, and different services that can be pr provided as well. Okay, the next service we're going to review is the OMH Assertive Community Treatment, which is an ACT team. Um, and these teams provide mobile intensive treatment and support to people with psychiatric disabilities. So the real focus of this treatment team is um, on the improvement of an individual's quality of life in the community and to reduce the need for inpatient care by providing these intense community-based treatment services by an interdisciplinary team of mental health professionals. Um, and who are these mental health professionals that make up these ACT teams? They can include members of the fields of psych psychiatry, nursing, psychology, social work, substance abuse, and vocational rehabilitation. And this is really to truly meet the individual um, where they are in terms of their greatest need and to best accommodate them in terms of putting together a supportive team to help them in their recovery. Um, also important to know is that treatment is focused on individuals who have not successfully engaged in traditional forms of treatment. So this is a unique form of treatment geared towards individuals who might have not found success in other traditional forms. Okay. So the next service we're going to talk, review um, is the OMH Personalized Recovery or Oriented Services, or PROS. So this is a comprehensive recovery oriented program for individuals with severe and persistent mental illness. Again, the goal of this program in particular is to integrate treatment, support, and rehabilitation in a manner that facilitates the individual's recovery. So we have different goals that are listed, including improving functioning, reducing inpa inpatient utilization, reducing emergency services. Again, those are big, those are emphasized greatly in this transition to managed care, increasing employment, um, securing preferred housing, and the final four bullets are the different service components of the program. So there's community rehabilitation support, intensive rehabilitation, ongoing rehabilitation and support, and ongoing rehabilitation and support is really um, supports to assist individuals in managing their sy symptoms in the competitive workplace. And the fourth bullet is actually optional. Um, it, can, it can include a clinic treatment modality. So that's the, final, the fourth and final component of PROS. Okay. Our next OMH service that we're talking about is intensive psychiatric rehabilitation treatment. So abbreviated to <laughs> IPRT, this is often, um, you know, we, we often use acronyms and I'm trying today to be consistent in, in discussing the entire, <laughs> the entire phrase for the treatment, um, but a lot of times it is just referred to as IPRT. And this is an intensive psychiatric rehabilitation treatment program that is time limited and with active psychiatric rehabilitation designed to assist a patient in both forming and achieving mutually agreed upon goals in living, learning, working, and social environments, as well as to intervene with psychiatric rehabilitation technologies and to overcome functional, de functional disabilities and to improve environmental supports. Okay. So our next service that we're going to talk through is the OMH Continuing Day Treatment. 
Okay. So this program provides active treatment and rehabilitation designed to maintain or enhance the current levels of functioning and skills, to maintain community living, and to develop self-awareness and self-esteem through the exploration and development of patients' strengths and interests. So the different services that might be involved in a CDT program are all listed here, but again, just looking through everything starting with assessment and treatment planning, discharge planning, medication therapy, medication education, talking about you know, making sure that the individual understands the medication and case management, health screening and referral, psychiatric rehabilitation, readiness development and determination, and referral and symptom management. And the, the final bullets on this slide really talk about the different services that could also be provided as a part of continuing day treatment, whether that's supportive skills training, active therapy, verbal therapy, crisis intervention services, and clinical support services. Okay. So our final OMH, and before, actually, before I jump into this one, I just um, thank you for everyone who's chatting in. We appreciate your questions and your comments. I am hearing from a few people that the audio quality is um, maybe cutting in and out a little bit. So Alam and I are literally t are sitting right in front of the phone and doing our best to speak right into it. I know when I have been um, on the participant side of these webinars, sometimes if my audio quality isn't working, it does help to log in and log out. So I might encourage you to do that. Um, but thank you again for keeping us you know, aware of what's going on and how the webinar is being delivered. We really appreciate it. Okay. So OMH partial hospitalization. So what is this service? A partial hospitalization program can provide active treatment designed to stabilize and ameliorate acute symptoms and to serve as an alternative to inpatient hospitalization or to reduce the length of a hospital stay within a medically supervised program. So the following I'm just going to talk through briefly. These are different services. Um, that a partial hospitalization program can, can provide. So again, assessment and treatment planning, health screening and referral, symptom management, medication therapy and education, verbal therapy, case management, um, active activity therapy, discharge planning, and clinical support services. Okay, and I think with that, I'm going to pass along to my colleague, Alam, who's going to take us through the different substance use disorders. Thank you, Meg. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the substance use disorder services here. Uh, and again, as Meg mentioned, this is not everything. We're just highlighting a few here. So we're going to start off by talking about the OASIS Certified Outpatient Clinic. Uh, with this specific service, it can actually be provided by a community or hospital program. And the outpatient clinic pretty much provides an abstinence-based drug treatment program for people who live uh, at home or in the community. Um, it assists individuals who suffer from substance use disorder and additionally their collaterals, also known as family members and or significant others uh, that are also involved in the individual's life. Um, so this also may provide um, an intensive outpatient uh, level of care. Uh, generally speaking, there's a standard outpatient, intensive outpatient, and outpatient rehab services that we're going to actually discuss a little bit further down the line. The next service is the OASIS Certified Opioid Treatment Programs, uh, also known as OTPs. And these also may be provided by a community or hospital program. Um, so these programs are OASIS certified, uh, sites where methadone or other approved medications, such as buprenorphine perhaps, are prescribed and administered to treat those who have an opioid dependency. Um, following one or more medical treatment protocols is defined by the uh, Rule 14 NYCRR Part 822, uh, which are contained in the regs. Uh, OTP also offers medical and uh, support services, including counseling and educational along with vocational, uh, vocational rehab services. Um, let me see. So the goal of this program pretty much is to reduce physical and social harm to people that are dependent on opiates by providing relief from the withdrawal symptoms. Uh, it's in essence a harm reduction model for people who are opiate dependent. 
And the next OASIS uh, certified uh, rehab uh, level of care is the outpatient day rehab, uh, which also can be provided by a community or a hospital program. And this is very similar to the 820, well, the uh, standard outpatient, which in essence is also certified to provide regular outpatient rehab services. Um, these specific services are designed to assist specific individuals with significantly chronic conditions who are typically scheduled to attend the rehab program three to five days a week um, and at least for four hours per day. And with that, we're going to walk right through into the HCBS services. Um, so this is just going to give us a general idea of the available HCBS services. Um, as Meg mentioned, on the MCTAC website, you'll find previous overarching webinars and slide decks that actually uh, give the whole picture of the HCBS service world, in addition to clustered trainings that um, and slides that are made available on the website as well for each specific uh, cluster of these services as they're listed on this screen. Um, so please feel free to visit the website and get a more in-depth look at these services um, and the details that go along with them. But for the purpose of this webinar, we're going to do a brief um, skimming through these um, services. So we'll start off with peer supports. And peer supports are uh, peer-delivered services with a reha rehabilitation and recovery focus. Um, these supports are really designed to promote the skills for coping with and managing the behavioral health symptoms for the individual going through uh, several of these uh, programs. So it's a really great support to be able to offer to an individual who could use the guidance and support of someone who's been there and done that. Um, some of the activities are, uh, that are included are, att are intended to achieve the identified goals or objectives that are actually notated in the recovery plan, um, and then emphasize on the opportunity for the peers to support each other through um, expanding of these skills and strategies to move forward in their process of, towards recovery. I'm going to pass this back to Meg. She's right. going to talk a little bit about the family support and training. Thanks, Alam. Sure. Yes. So family support and training. So this is one of our home and community-based services. Um, this is training and support that's necessary to facilitate engagement and active family participation in an individual's recovery process. This is provided only at the request of the individual. So again, in putting together an individual's plan of care, it's very important that the care manager speak to the individual about what, enta what is entailed in family support and what that means for having a family involved in the process. Um, again, it's recovery-oriented, it's trauma-informed in its approach to partnering with families and other supporters. Family is defined as any of the individuals who are on this list <laughs> who also who live with or support a person who is served on the, on the HCBS waiver and may include a family of choice. So if I identify um, a person in my life who might not be actually related to me, but I see in my day-to-day -day and I consider a family member, that is a family of choice. A parent, um, a spouse or significant other, children, relatives, foster family, in-laws. It does not include individuals who are employed to care for the participant. So that's really important in terms of the engagement process when care managers are putting together this plan of care with the individual to emphasize that. Um, and also, this modality, um, I'm sorry, this service includes training, which is, includes instruction about the different treatment regimens that might be available, um, elements of recovery and support options, recovery concepts, and medication education specified in the individual recovery plan. So really this is all about making sure that if an individual identifies family as a support and they would like them involved in their process, um, that this HCBS service is about making sure the family is educated and aware of what the individual is going through, what the different treatment regimens actually mean, what you know might be entailed with different medication modalities, all about training and support for the family and individual. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So the next service we're going to talk about is the education support. And again, I know there's a lot of text here. We're going to try to skim through the slide, but still give um, a solid idea of what this service entails. So the education support service is really meant to assist the individuals who want to start or return to school or any form of formal training with the goal of achieving the skill necessary to obtain eventual employment. So this is for someone who's voiced to uh, the care manager that they're interested in um, eventually getting employment within a specific field um, and would require specific training for that field. So um, that goal must be listed or that uh, the eventual skill development must be listed in their service plan. Um, the education support services are offered to the extent to which they are not available under a program funded um, or available for funding by the New York State Adult Career and Continuing Education Service Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, it also may consist of general adult education services such as applying for or attending community college, university, or college level courses. Um, or classes, vocational training, tutoring to receive uh, a TAS diploma. In addition, support to the participants um, to participate in any kind of apprenticeship program. Uh, the, the person must relate to an employment goal, as mentioned, that or skill development that's documented in the service plan. And um, ongoing supported education, which is conducted after a participant is successfully admitted to an educational program. And then ongoing follow along is uh, follow along support is also available for an indefinite period as needed by the participant to maintain their status as a registered student. Okay. So I'm going to talk through some employment support services. Um, and you'll notice online at MCTAC when we do trainings on home and community-based services, we often cluster services together. Um, and we cluster the education and employment support services together. So when you look on our website, if you're looking for any follow-up slides or any webinar recordings specifically geared towards these services, uh, education and employment will be clustered together. So I just want to emphasize that. I know that can be confusing sometimes uh, when you're looking for something, but just know that employment and ed are grouped together um, on our website in terms of our training and technical assistance. So these are just the, the four different areas of employment support services that are encompassed in the employment, um, home and community-based service portion of the tier. So the first, again, <laughs> we apologize for the, the text, but we do know that this might be a, tr um, a training and resource that is available online afterwards. Mm -hmm. So we just wanted to be inclusive of the material that's out there. Um, and really, pre-vocational employment support is a time-limited service that's all about preparing a participant for paid or unpaid employment with the ultimate goal of competitive employment. So really this is about providing learning and work experiences for an individual who has identified employment as a goal. Um, it occurs over a defined period of time with specific person-centered goals, and it provides support to an individual who needs ongoing support to learn a new job or maintain a job in a competitive work environment or self-employment arrangement. The outcome of this activity is the documentation of the participant's stated career objective and a career plan used to guide individual employment support. So again, Alam and I mentioned in our previous webinars how critical and important documentation is, and this is just a, another example. This needs to be included in the plan of care. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, these are some concepts that might be taught during the pre-vocational employment support service. Um, what it means work compliance, attendance, task completion, problem solving and safety, all different things to really prepare an individual for success um, in employment. Um, this is also, also included as providing scheduled activities out of an individual's home and support acquisition. Um, gaining work-related experience is considered crucial for job placement, and services do not include development of job-specific skills, okay? So, changing gears a little bit, transitional employment support is designed to strengthen the participant's work record and work skills toward the goal of achieving assisted or unassisted competitive employment. This may only be provided by clubhouse, psychosocial club programs, or recovery centers, and it provides learning and work experiences 
where the individual can develop general, non-job, task-specific strengths and soft skills that contribute to employability. So again, these aren't job-specific tasks that an individual is trained on, but in general, what goes into being successful as an employee in, at a job, okay? Um, and the outcome of this activity, again, documentation of the participa participants' stated career objectives and a career plan used to guide individual employment. So you can see these services really all build into each other, okay? Intensive employment support assists individuals in obtaining and keeping competitive employment. This is all based upon the evidence-based practice of supportive employment. It consists of really intensive supports that would enable an individual for whom competitive employment might not be likely um, absent those supports. This provides supports to participants who need to learn a new job and maintain a job in a competitive employment or self-employment arrangement. And the outcome of intensive employment support is the documentation of the participant's stated career objective and a career plan used to guide individual employment support. Okay. And this is our final employment home and community-based service. Um, and this is provided after a participant successfully obtains and becomes oriented to competitive and integrated employment. So after an individual receives a job, that is when this, this HCBS service would start, this particular one. It's available for an indefinite period as needed by the participant to maintain their, their paid employment position. It supports participants who need ongoing support to learn a new job and to maintain a job in a competitive employment or self-employment arrangement. Um, again, just making sure that an individual is compensated at or above the minimum wage and they receive the level of benefits paid by the employer for the same or similar work performed by individuals without disabilities. And again, the outcome of this activity is the documentation of the participant's stated career objectives and career plan used to guide individual employment support. Great, that leads us right to the non-medical transportation service, uh, which is actually offered in addition to any medical transportation that's already uh, furnished. Uh, also, the non-medical transportation services are available for, for eligible individuals to access transportation to destinations that are related to any goal that's included on the individual's plan of care. Now, some examples of these are um, something that's considered non-repetitive, right? So it's, it's limited duration and specified, in, again, in the plan of care. So an example of that could be transportation to a job interview, to a college fair, a wellness seminar, or a GED prep class for example. Um, so it's a really great uh, service to be able to offer an individual, especially in collaboration with an education or employment goal. Okay. So one of the other clusters of home and community-based services that we've trained on is the crisis respite cluster. And I'm going to talk through short-term crisis respite. Um, and short-term care, short-term crisis respite is really about short-term care and an intervention strategy for individuals who are experiencing challenges in daily life um, that would create risk and an escalation of symptoms that cannot be managed in the person's home and community environment. So really what we're taking from that little pocket of words is that it's short-term care and an intervention strategy to help reduce the risk um, that an individual might be triggered um, that might escalate symptoms that can't be managed in a person's home and community environment. The other component of uh, short-term crisis respite is just that there's imminent risk for escalation of symptoms. Um, again, we want to help maintain an individual functioning in both their home and community environment. Um, and referrals for this service might come from the emergency room, um, commu the community itself, um, self-referrals from the individual. If they can, you know, on the plan of care, there is a portion of that template that we talked through in previous webinars that really looks at talking to an individual about what their triggers are. So if an individual feels triggered, they are able to make a self-referral. Um, any member of the treatment team can make a referral for short-term crisis respite, as well as um, any person who's part of a step-down plan from an inpatient setting. And crisis respite is provided in site-based residential settings as well. Okay. 
so in addition to the short-term uh, crisis respite uh, service, we have the intensive crisis respite service. And this is, again, a short-term residential care and clinical intervention strategy for those who are facing significant behavioral health crises, including some of these as an example. So individuals who are suicidal, who happen to express homicidal ideation, uh, experiencing any kind of acute escalation of mental health symptoms, and persons that must, the person must be agreeable on a suicide prevention plan. Um, and the individual themselves are at imminent risk for loss of, the, of their functional abilities, and which may in turn cause um, safety concerns for themselves and those uh, and others without this level of care. Uh, the, imminent, the immediate goal is to provide supports to help the individual stabilize and return to previous level of functioning or as a step down from an inpatient hospitalization level of care. Okay, so now we are at the final cluster of HCBS services, and the first service that I'm going to discuss is Community Psychiatric Support and Treatment, otherwise known as CPST in all of our trainings. So what is Community Psychiatric Support and Treatment? It is a time-limited, goal-directed supports and solution-focused interventions. Um, the following activities are designed to help individuals with serious mental illness to achieve stability and functional improvement in each of the following areas, whether it be daily living, uh, managing finances, maintaining or finding housing, education, employment, personal recovery and or resilience, um, family and interpersonal relationships and community integration, so all of these areas. Um, it really is designed to provide mobile treatment and rehabilitation services to individuals who might otherwise have difficulty in engaging in site-based programs. So this is just another uh, unique way of providing services to these individuals um, who, again, might have difficulty engaging in any site-based program. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the psychosocial rehabilitation, also known as PSR, uh, this service is designated to assist the individual with compensating for or eliminating functional deficits and interpersonal and or environmental barriers. The activities that are included must be intended to achieve the identified goal or objectives as set forth in the individual service plan, uh, which is why we highlight and ensure that all the possible services are on the uh, plan of care, uh, so that way the individual can take advantage of these uh, available services. And finally, the intent is to restore the individual's functional level uh, to the fullest possible uh, level. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about habilitation. Um, so this is really typically provided on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and it's designed to assist individuals and participants in acquiring, retaining, and improving skills such as communication and socialization, self-help, you know, domestic and self-care, fine and gross motor skills, mobility, personal adjustment, relationship development, use of community resources and adaptive skills. It's a wide range of different skills that's covered in habilitation. Um, a big component of this is assisting participants with developing skills necessary for community living. And services include such things as um, instruction in accessing transportation, shopping and performing other necessary activities such as you know, self-advocacy, locating housing, working with landlords and roommates and on budgeting. Um, services are really designed to enable the participant to integrate fully into the community and, in, and work towards recovery, health, welfare, safety, and maximum independence of the participant. Okay, so that concludes the different service um, components that we are gonna review today. Um, I do wanna highlight one thing. So a, a quick question came in about a listing of all these services somewhere with addresses and phone numbers. So I would say that your best bet in finding a listing of all these services um, if you're looking for definitions, I would visit OASAS and OMH's website where you can find a definition of both the state services, um, a comprehensive all-encompassing list, not just the ones that we reviewed today, um, and also both of those websites should have links to the different um, definitions of the home and community-based services. MCTAC also has a lot of material on the different home and community-based services, so I would just direct you, direct you there. Um, 
And so again, we just wanted to emphasize that today we reviewed um, particular services, not all-encompassing state plan services, and MCTAC will be doing future training um, around deficit and contract-funded programs that are not covered in the content of today's webinar. We just want to acknowledge that today's webinar wasn't comprehensive of all the services that are out there, um, and again, that just training will be delivered on these programs um, in the future. Okay, and this slide is really just a snippet of what the MCTAC, uh, the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center website, looks like. Um, we want to encourage everyone to really visit the website. There's so many resources to be used there, so many tools. As Meg mentioned, there's a glossary with all the acronyms that are used regularly throughout this transition to managed health care, and um, it's, really, it's really a great resource uh, to kind of keep in mind. Also. For those future trainings that are coming up, we encourage you to sign up for the MCTAC listserv, um, so that way you can get updates as they come along, um, and, and also ensure that you stay up on the possible events and webinars and in-person trainings that are coming up. Um, under the events tab. Uh, in addition to that, you'll find that at the bottom of the screen you have an email where just in case you didn't have a chance or you think of a question um, that you haven't been able to chat in, feel free to email us any of your questions or concerns and we can definitely do our best to get back to you in a timely fashion with the most um, accurate information. And that email is mctac.info at nyu.edu. Um, in addition to that, you can feel free to tune in. We also we have our last um, training uh, for the uh, plan of care scheduled for tomorrow. So for those of you who are interested in getting another dose of information, you can feel free to tune in then. Or for any, uh, any of your teammates that have not had a chance to tune in today, please encourage them to tune in tomorrow. And again, if for any reason you'd like to review this information, both the recording and the slides will be available after tomorrow. Uh, training has been completed. Yep, so I think that's all that we have for today. And again, thank you so much for attending our webinar and for participating. Uh, please feel free to, again, send over any questions or concerns, and we look forward to, to hopefully uh, seeing, uh, well, hearing or perhaps <laughs> talking with you guys at tomorrow's webinar. Thank you again, and have a great day.